Frances Elser, born into a rich as hell family, wasn't exactly the poster child image of a well kept, wealthy girl. During her teenage years, she was friends with a group of troublemakers who frequented bars at night and got in fist fights for fun. Though ruthless and bossy to others, the friends treated each other with compassion and respect, especially in making sure Frances felt included given her disability. Thus, the group primarily went out at nighttime and only went to dimly lit bars. At age 19, Frances met a man who went by the nickname Junior, who was working as bootleg alcohol distributor at the time. While they benefited from each other sexually and financially, they still maintained a close mutual friendship. Or so Frances had thought. When she confronted Junior about an unexpected pregnancy, within a couple weeks, Junior packed his bags and disappeared without a trace, leaving Frances a single mother. Frances began isolating herself from her friends and began a new life alone with her child. In his childhood, Henry suffered a significant amount of neglect from Frances. To cope with the stress of responsibility, Frances took the avoidant route by numbing reality out with alcohol and smoking. She rarely paid attention to Henry, and when she did, her attention was paid to emotional abuse. When either drunk or hate tempered, Frances became more violently impulsive and would throw things, yell, and even hit or slap Henry. Often to show her patience was running short with her son, she would shove lit cigarette butts onto his bare skin. In elementary school, Henry quickly befriended a girl named Nancy O'Connell. The two were somewhat outcasted by their peers, so they naturally took comfort in keeping each other company. Henry was fascinated by Nancy's ability to see colors associated with sounds and thought she had magical powers. This positive reaction fascinated Nancy as he was the first person not to ostracize or flat out deny this aspect of her. In Nancy's life, support was hard to find. It seemed everyone in her immediate family was successful in school, at work, and at being normal. Her parents had no apparent struggles, her two older sisters were straight A students, even her baby brother was the perfect, well behaved little boy. Meanwhile, Nancy was rather average in her classes, wanted to create more than study, and had color sound synesthesia. Something her family just couldn't wrap their heads around, subsequently insisting she was making things up. When middle school rolled around, Nancy also began to struggle with dependency, which her family harshly frowned upon. She was insecure in her decisions and often needed reassurance and help in things others had no problem deciding on. Instead of providing her with this reassurance, her family instead gave her the suck it up treatment and left her in the dust. As Henry got older, Frances mellowed out a little. Only a little, though. She struggled less with alcohol, and her violent nature diminished. What remained was a strict, cold, manipulative woman who knew her way around her son's emotions. Henry was allowed out of the house less and less except for school. While it did inflict loneliness on the two, Nancy and Henry's friendship remained strong. Once they started college, they decided marriage would be the best decision. Even if they weren't romantically interested in each other, their friendship proved they were a perfect fit, and entering a lifelong partnership would be a major improvement to their lives. This decision didn't sit well with Frances. She practically became dead weight crying crocodile tears in Henry's arms, guilt tripping him over abandoning his poor, disabled mother. Henry struggled with his guilt, but Nancy was able to keep him focused on how much better their lives would be once they got him out of there. The couple went on with their plan and moved to the Chicago area, where Henry got a job in journalism. Nancy remained unemployed, so she focused on her favorite hobby, sewing. She'd mend clothes and make some of her own, sometimes as commission work for neighbors, once they were familiarized with her, listening to various radio stations while doing so. In their new home, the neighbors fell in love with the shy duo. Their next door neighbor, an elderly woman named Patty Rosalind, took a particular liking to the two and would always strike up a conversation with Henry before leaving for work. Or when Nancy went outside to hang up laundry. Patty wasn't the only neighbor interested in the couple, of course. Ray Barnett, who seemed to live alone, lived cater cornered from the Elsners. They were often seen in the evening, taking walks around the neighborhood and smoking. Similarly to Patty, they conversed with Henry when he got home from work. However, Henry started spending a little extra time out of the house in the evening to avoid them. Even just the smell of cigarettes brought Henry unavoidable memories his childhood abuse. As well as flashbacks, Henry had problems sleeping. Nightmares frequently woke him up, and he often had to get up and work on something to calm down enough and go back to sleep. A couple years after moving away, Frances gave the couple a call. Since Nancy was home all day every day, she was the first to speak with her. Frances started by apologizing and asked if they could work on mending their relationship. Nancy caved as Frances sounded genuine and decided to give her another chance. She was surprised by this change of heart, though who knows what a couple years can do to change a person. When Henry heard of the news, he was somewhat disturbed. Not just by his mom trying to contact him again, but especially by how convincing she seemed. For a while he couldn't figure out if he wanted to give Frances a second chance or not. One night, while the two were both at home, Frances asked to talk to Henry. He figured maybe, if she was genuinely serious about bettering herself, forgiving his mom might ease the nightmares and flashbacks. As you probably guessed, Frances wasn't just mending relationships out of the kindness of her heart. After a couple months of rebuilding their trust to Nancy, she slowly began to show concern over Henry. At first she asked if something was wrong with Henry, that he was acting sort of strange when talking to her. This escalated to Frances warning Nancy that her husband had talked of getting a divorce, that he was pained by how clingy Nancy was. Yet only stayed in the relationship in fear of her hurting him or herself. This made no sense to Nancy, and of course she took it with a grain of salt. Still, the idea scared her, and she was hesitant to tell Henry about this in case it really was true. However, Henry had been hearing some fishy stories of his own from Frances. When talking to Henry, at first Frances showed concern for Nancy, asking why she was acting strange. Again, it escalated to warning Henry that Nancy frequently vented her fears of Henry abandoning her, and that she would either hurt him or herself if he decided to leave. This made no sense to Henry either, but in case it was true, he held his tongue as well. Finally, after about a week of this nonsense, the two talked about what was going on. Of course it was bullshit, and the two were relieved to know it was just Frances causing trouble again. Well, this certainly wasn't good either, but it was better than secretly hiding things from each other. Henry promptly called Frances, gave her a piece of his mind, and asked her to leave them alone. With that episode of trouble over with, Henry and Nancy moved on with their life. Now, here's where the fun starts. Their street was on a party line, so really any one of their neighbors could listen on this family drama. One night, like every other night, Henry awoke to another nightmare. Carefully, he got up as to not wake up Nancy, and went to the kitchen to get some water. Waiting for him was a hand around his mouth, a knife across his throat, and the overwhelming scent of cigarette smoke. Ray noticed how a light would regularly go on in the Elser's house in the early, early morning. So all they had to do was pick the lock, once the two were certainly asleep, and wait in the shadows. Henry's body was dragged into the basement, where Ray finished the job. They intentionally left multiple, vicious stab wounds, to give the appearance of an emotionally driven crime. The knife used was one from the Elser's own kitchen, and Ray wielded it with a gloved hand. They toyed with the evidence at the crime scene, planting some against Nancy, and removing any directly leading to themselves, yet leaving enough to imply a stranger had entered the home. In the basement, next to Henry's body, they left Nancy's radio, and turned it on. They couldn't wait to see what the news thought of this one. Nancy awoke to a blood trail leading down to the basement, and the distant sound of the radio turned to her usual station. These led her to Henry. It took her a moment to process what had happened and come to her senses, but once she snapped out of her panic, she called 911, then called Frances to tell her what happened. Instead of comforting her, Frances seemed disgusted. You seriously
They also took note of the lingering cigarette smell, especially after hearing from Nancy that not only did the two never smoke, but that Henry was deeply sickened by anything related to cigarettes. Later in the investigation, the police received an anonymous tip insisting Nancy committed the crime. This person told the police Nancy had implied she wanted Henry dead over a divorce threat. The spotlight returned to Nancy. However, when this anonymous tip was brought up during police interviews with Nancy, she was quick to explain the situation with Francis. Because this made sense given Henry's aversion to cigarettes, they decided to investigate Francis a little. Francis pulled a convincing act of innocence, though, and the lead was lost again. Though they suspected a stranger had planted evidence, as it was the only idea that made any sense, the police were unable to find any clear leads as to who did it. Thus, they had no case, and the murder went unsolved. The media ate up this mysterious, perfect crime, and everyone was talking about it. Nancy moved in with a friend from high school, who happened to live in a neighboring state. She initially did this temporarily while she grieved and looked for a job, but no matter where she went, the murder followed her. Seeing it in the news, being recognized in public, even listening to the radio, something that was a huge comfort to Nancy, brought the memory back up. In fact, she couldn't even bear listening to the radio anymore. Finding her radio at the crime scene, the sight of Henry's body next to her radio, and the music playing from it, it was all too strongly associated together now. The accusations from Francis, the media popularizing the idea of her killing her husband, the demonization she received for it. Had she really killed Henry, and completely forgotten about it? How is that even realistically possible? Was her grief so bad that she entered some severe state of denial? She thought these things to herself, but it didn't make sense. Surely contemplating these things would break the delusion, but not once did she remember committing murder. Ray was never investigated by the police, and a year after the murder, they moved across the country to avoid the police's radar.